Good afternoon and welcome to the final video lecture of the semester. And we're going to talk about the second part of the Vietnam War. And this is where the United States really, really gets involved. So this is the part of the class where we talk about what we know as the Vietnam War. In Asia, it's known better as the Second Indochina War. Now what happens is, in 1961, John F. Kennedy is going to publicly announce plans to help South Vietnam maintain its independence. And this means that the United States is going to start sending military aid and economic aid to South Vietnam. And December 1961, the very first United States soldier arrives. Now these are not combat soldiers, these are just advisors. They're supposed to help train the South Vietnamese army. By the end of 1962, uh, there are about 11,000 soldiers in Vietnam, and that number just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. Now the United States Army is training the South Vietnamese Army how to fight, but the South Vietnamese Army is losing every battle against these Viet Cong guerrillas. If you remember from the last video, these Viet Cong guerrillas, they are communist sympathizers, communist people who live in the South. When the Northern Vietnamese army realizes that this fight has begun, only then does the North Vietnamese army start sending troops to the South to help the Viet Cong. Uh, at the same time this is happening, there's a, there is this anti-government movement and the South Vietnamese president, Go Dinh Diem, starts to uh, crack down and try to stop it. Uh, Diem, who is a Catholic, uses this anti-government movement to have thousands of Buddhists arrested. He calls these Buddhists communists, and many of these Buddhists are tortured or killed. Many of the Buddhist monks burned themselves to death in protest. And this was done in full view of cameras, this was done in full view of uh, the news. It's pretty gruesome time. Well, things get so bad that on November 1st, 1963, the United States Army helps the South Vietnamese Army overthrow Go Dinh Diem and then Diem is executed along with Diem's brother. And this ends up destabilizing the South Vietnamese government and South Vietnam from November of 1963 to July of 1965 goes through 10 different governments, many of them military-led. So what that tells you is South Vietnam is not a stable country in any way, shape, or form. You also have to look at something called the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This is going to occur after JFK is killed. Lyndon B. Johnson is going to become the new president. And LBJ, he is a very, very much anti-communist person. He wants to increase U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And in March of 1964, he authorizes the secret plans called Operation 34A and Operation 35A. And basically what he does is at night, South Vietnamese Marines and commandos are loaded onto U.S. Navy ships. The U.S. Navy ship will land these Vietnamese troops onto North Vietnamese beaches. The South Vietnamese troops will sabotage stuff in North Vietnam, and then they'll load back on to the ship before daybreak. Well, on August 4th of 1964, there are two U.S. destroyer ships, the USS Maddox and the USS Turner Joy. They supposedly come under attack by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. This has never been proven. The only evidence is electronic evidence. Uh, nobody on the ship saw any North Vietnamese torpedo boats. Nobody on the ships heard any gunshots. This is all supposed to have been done and proven by electronic intelligence and radio signals. Most people today think that this was probably made up by the president and his administration. On August 7th, LBJ goes to Congress 
uses this attack on these two U.S. naval ships as evidence that North Vietnam has committed an act of war against the United States. And the Gulf of Tonkin resolution is passed. This Gulf of Tonkin re resolution is going to be extremely important because it's going to give the president permission to do whatever he wants in Vietnam. And he acts on that very quickly. On February 11, 1965, he authorizes something called Operation Rolling Thunder. Operation Rolling Thunder is going to be this massive bombing campaign. And it goes from March 2nd to March 31st, 1965. There are more bombs dropped in that one month than in all of World War II. Four million tons of bombs are dropped on South Vietnam. Those are the people that are supposed to be protected by the United States. They get the most bombs. Three million tons of bombs land on Laos, a country that's not even involved in this. One million tons of bombs land on North Vietnam, who is the actual enemy. And then half a million tons of bombs land in Cambodia. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is also going to lead to American combat troops. On March 8, 1965, the first U.S. combat troops arrive. It's 3,500 U.S. Marines. They storm a beach near the city of Da Nang, and they're greeted by the friendly people. Uh, the U.S. Marines, they do this World War II style beach landing complete with, with boats uh, running up to the beach. The landing craft, the the door drops down and these marines get off the boat in full combat gear ready to fight. They're met on the beach by local populations who put uh, legs, you know, the, the flower necklaces on them and say welcome to Vietnam. Completely, you wouldn't believe it if you didn't find video and picture of it. By the end of December we go from 3,500 marines up to 200,000 combat troops. And by 1968, there are a total of over half a million combat troops in Vietnam. Side note, South Korea is involved in this as well, and they have several hundred thousand troops there as well. By the end of 1967, the United States has over 15,000 killed and over 110,000 wounded soldiers. A turning point in the war is the Tet Offensive. Um, Ho Chi Minh and Vo Nguyen Giap are still at it. In 1967, Vo Nguyen Giap, who is the general for the North Vietnamese Army, uh, he decides to take a, a play out of the, the old playbook and he's going to try to find a base far away and attack the Americans just like he did against the French. It worked at Dien Bien Phu, he thinks it'll work against the Americans too. And the base that's chosen is this marine base that's at the upper northwest corner of South Vietnam, it's called Khe San. And there are over 35,000 North Vietnamese troops who attack 6,000 Marines. The biggest difference between 1954 and 1967 is the fact that the U.S. Air Force is more um, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to say powerful, but they're more coordinated. We'll use that word. And the U.S. Marines are able to call in close support. They're able to call in napalm strikes and bombing that is right on the base, but the Marines are able to pinpoint exactly where the bombs need to drop, and the base at Quezon is going to survive. But in reality, the attack in Khe San is a diversionary tactic. Um, beginning in 1967, Vo Nguyen Giap, he starts to organize a coordinated attack on the major South Vietnamese cities. And this is going to eventually become known as the Tet Offensive. And it's a simultaneous attack on over a hundred cities, a hundred villages, a hundred towns, all throughout South Vietnam. The idea behind this is that if the South Vietnamese see how powerful and how coordinated the communists are, that there would be this popular uprising. Well, unfortunately for Vo Nguyen Giap and the North Vietnamese, 
By the time we get to 1967, 1968, most of the people in the South, they did not want to be communists anymore. The 10 Offensive, on a military standpoint, is going to fail. The Tet Offensive is a failure. North Vietnamese loses almost 100,000 troops. But it has a devastating psychological effect on Americans and South Vietnamese. You have a, the head general, a guy named General Westmoreland, is on TV saying that we almost have this fight won. America is going to get to come home soon. We have defeated the communists. And you literally have bombs going off and explosions that start in the background of his news conference. And it's at this point that the Americans start to think that the war cannot be won. And what happens is the Tet Offensive is going to convince the U.S. government the only way to end the war is to negotiate. There can be no clear military victory. And surprisingly, the United States government knew that from the beginning. Documents have been released that, that show that the government knew that this was going to be a losing effort. The United States public, they feel lied to, and they don't trust the U.S. government anymore. Now, there's also this idea of Vietnamization. When Richard Nixon is elected president in 1969, he does so by promising to end the war in Vietnam. Now, secretly, Richard Nixon had been in contact with the North Vietnamese government and said, hey, don't end the war until I'm in charge because I'll give you a better deal than LBJ would have. So when Richard Nixon, he becomes president in 1969, uh, he is going to turn much of the fighting over to the South Vietnamese army. And U.S. troops do begin to leave. In August 1969, the first 25,000 troops leave Vietnam, and another 65,000 leave by March of 1970. So it looks like Richard Nixon is keeping his promise. More and more of the fighting is going to Vietnam, South Vietnam, I should say, their army, less of the fighting is being done by the United States Army. But even though this is happening, North Vietnamese, they're refusing to negotiate the end of the war. In April of 1970, Richard Nixon is going to order the invasion of Cambodia, a country that's not even involved in this fight. When the United States public finds out that this has happened, they're really, really angry at Nixon. They accuse Nixon of lying and war protests in this country are going to skyrocket. So e even though Nixon says, I'm going to end the war, in one way he's escalating the war. And you still have the U.S. Air Force, which is pretty much bombing everything in sight. The U.S. Air Force doesn't stop at all. Now war protests are going to be a very big part of this war, especially here in the United States. And these war protests are going to be seen throughout the world. Um, the war protests are going to begin almost as soon as the war does. Uh, in 1964, 1965, your first protests against the war are going to start in colleges. Um, most of these early protests are seen as un-American. They're largely ignored. It's seen as this hippie college thing. But as the casualties start to mount, and as the draft gets going, the war protests start to pick up steam. And these are not small war protests. If you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, there's a famous scene in there where Forrest Gump accidentally attends a war protest. Well, things like that were actually happening. In April of 1967, 500,000 people go to New York City to protest the war. In October of 1967, there's over 100,000 people who participate in a rally against the war. And that October 1967 rally is the one that you see in Forrest Gump. Even here in Carrollton, there was a war protest. West Georgia College students, now known as UWG, uh, they write up a petition, college students sign it, and then they march the two miles from the university to downtown Carrollton where they presented the mayor of Carrollton a petition and a protest demanding that the mayor of Carrollton end the war. So these war protests were in big cities, small cities, and colleges all over the place. 
you even have Vietnam veterans coming back and protesting the war because they've seen what's actually happening there. And these Vietnam veterans, they would stand outside military base and as new recruits come in, they would hand out anti-war literature. They would encourage people to resist the draft. They would go on television and give speeches against the draft. A very famous um, speech was done by a politician named John Kerry. John Kerry was a senator. John Kerry was a vice president, or he, no, vice, he was a presidential candidate. And he was, uh, I think, the secretary of state for Obama for a short amount of time. But he goes on and gives a public speech against the war. Um, there's even an event in 1971 where 800 veterans go to the U.S. Capitol and they give a speech against the war and they throw the medals that they won into the Capitol building because they didn't think they deserved them. And what's really weird about that is while you have these Vietnam veterans who are dressed in their military uniforms giving these passionate speeches, there's barbed wire and barricades surrounding the U.S. Capitol. Now how does the war end? Well. The secret negotiations that Nixon promised, they start in 1972. The South Vietnamese, they have no idea that these negotiations are happening. The South, South Vietnam is going to continue fighting while President Nixon and the North Vietnamese are going to negotiate a ceasefire. On January 23rd, 1973, the ceasefire is agreed to. It's made public. South Vietnam basically says, what the heck? We didn't know anything about this. And the ceasefire goes into effect on January 28th. The United States agrees to remove all of its men, all of its military personnel by March 31st, about two months after the ceasefires agreed. They also agreed to return all prisoners of war. Unfortunately, that did not happen in all cases. There's a DMZ, a demilitarized zone set up. It's supposed to be a temporary division until a peace treaty can be signed. And the peace negotiation is going to allow 150,000 North Vietnamese troops to remain in South Vietnam. The South Vietnamese military, the South Vietnamese government, they're shocked by this. They're not expecting this. And there is absolutely no way that South Vietnam can stand up on its own two feet. Now the United States, it promises South Vietnam support if something happens. But by 1974, North and South Vietnam are already fighting again. Unfortunately, also, uh, the U.S. promise to help South Vietnam, it cannot be done because there is so much anti-war feeling in this country. In 1975, the South Vietnamese government, they lose control of all their cities, and by April 30th, the capital city falls to communist forces. And the picture there, that's the very last days of the U.S. Embassy. Thousands of South Vietnamese were brought into the U.S. Embassy and evacuated by a helicopter because if they had stayed in North Vietnam they would have been killed. So it's not a happy ending and it takes a long time before the United States and Vietnam are back on speaking terms. But today Vietnam and the United States are important trading partners. I don't know if you would call us allies or not, but we do have a very good trading and economic relationship with Vietnam. But it took from 1975 until about 2000 for that to happen. So that's how the, the class ends on the sad note of the Vietnam War being a loss. Um, unfortunately, with the way the semester has gone, I can't go on to uh, what happens next with the war over the United States or anything like that. But. Um, you can always read more if you if you want. Uh, it's, it's available for you there. All right, so your final exam is available. It's due on May 3rd, which is Sunday. I've moved the reflection due date and the museum review due date also to May 3rd. So everything's going to be due on Sunday. You're probably also wondering where the secret word quiz is. There's not one. I hope you're not mad that you sat through the whole thing to uh, wait for it but there's not a secret word quiz this week uh, since you have the final. And the last thing I want to say, it's been a weird semester. Thank you for putting up with it. I hope to see you again soon. Um, 
I look forward to seeing some of you, hopefully all of you, take another class with me. And uh, if you have any ideas or any suggestions on how I can make these videos better for the summer, please email me. I've never had to do these before and I want to make them the best I can. So if you have any ideas that can help your fellow students in the summer, please don't be afraid to let me know so I can improve what I do. Until next time, it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.